Hi, Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. In this video I'm going to discuss the general design principles of cohort studies. I'll talk about when they're useful and I'll also discuss the limitations that they have in answering epidemiological questions. So as a reminder of how study designs are organized, studies can be either descriptive or analytic. Analytic studies can be either experimental studies like randomized control trials or observational studies like cohort and case control studies. We're going to focus in this video on cohort studies and they're observational. What observational means is researchers, we don't intervene. We just watch what happens to people naturally. In the case of a cohort study, we watch to see what outcomes develop in these people. As a further reminder, primary research is broken up into randomized controlled trials, the observational studies, cohort and case control studies, and a couple other study designs we're not going to talk about. Now the ordering of this hierarchy is important. Um, it goes in uh, reverse order of bias. So the risk of bias is lowest in randomized controlled trials, followed by cohort studies, followed by case control studies. So what are cohort studies? So cohort studies start out with a group of patients who are healthy. They don't have the disease that we're interested in. And the patients are broken up into an exposed cohort and an unexposed cohort. And then these two cohorts are followed forward in time for the development of disease. So this is a prospective cohort study. Now cohort is just a group of people. It's nothing more than that. So in this case we have an exposed cohort and an unexposed cohort. Now cohort studies can also be done retrospectively and instead of starting at the present and going forward we actually go back in time, assemble our exposed and unexposed cohorts, come forward to the present time and look to see in each of these cohorts how many people have developed disease or not. So why might we do a retrospective cohort? Well a couple of reasons. One is if a disease takes a long time to develop we can go backwards in time, break people up into exposed and unexposed cohorts, come forward in time till the present and time has elapsed, so we've saved ourselves a lot of time. The other thing that retrospective cohort studies are often done within is other studies that have already been done and the data is just sitting there. So you can go back and, and break people up into exposed and unexposed groups depending on your exposure of interest. Uh, so that's probably the two most common reasons that you'd see a retrospective cohort study. Still designed the same way, broken up on exposure status, followed forward for the development of disease. Now cohort study designs can be used to determine prognosis and harm. So prognosis is once people have a disease, we look to see what happens to them. And then harm is people who don't have disease yet, we look to see the risk or the rate of them developing new disease. So the same study design can be used in two different ways. And the measure of association between exposure and disease in a cohort study is a relative risk. So there's some pros and cons of a cohort study. Let's first talk about the strengths. Well, it's the only observational study design that can establish incidence or risk of disease directly. It's very good for multiple outcomes because we start with exposure and we follow people forward to see what happens to them. We can measure as many different outcomes as we'd like. So we can look at all the different things that could happen to somebody after an exposure. It's actually good for rare exposures and things like, let's say, spill at a chemical plant in the all of our population is a very rare exposure but we can go capture everybody who is exposed to that chemical and follow them forward to see what happens to them so it's a good study design for rare exposures but it does have some limitations it's not good for rare diseases we have to follow lots and lots of people to see those few rare diseases it's not great for diseases that take a long time to develop or have a long latency now if you do the study and carry it out long enough you will detect those people with disease but it means you have to follow people for a long period of time that gets expensive and then people start dropping out and getting lost to follow up so the quality of your data goes down and the risk of bias goes up and finally it's not really good to, to study multiple exposures it's really designed to look at only one or two exposures see what happens to people so it's not the best design if you want to see lots and lots of different types of exposures what happens to people it's really not an efficient design to do that. Now cohort studies have given us lots of important information um, in clinical care. Probably the most famous cohort study and the biggest one has been the Framingham Risk Study that looked at uh, cardiovascular risk factors. It really defined what they were. Another important cohort study that really shaped medicine um, a couple of decades back was the Nurses Health Study. 
very important study looking at postmenopausal women and the risk of cardiovascular disease if you're on hormones or not. Really a very important study that influenced medical care. So cohort studies are very important um, in giving us a lot of epidemiologic information. They will continue to be important uh, into the future um, as we try to study new exposures and risk factors to see um, what happens to our patients. I hope this video has helped you understand more about cohort study designs. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the course website or through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.